We're going to talk today about breeding cordyceps militaris. So I think the last time I was there with you guys, I talked about cultivation and where, where we've gone with cultivation. And um, you guys still hold um, a, a place in my heart and in the history of cordyceps cultivation, because the first time I ever taught a class on cultivating cordyceps was in Decatur um, and Cornelia and Sam uh, set that all up for me. So that was where the first class in the United States ever happened on cultivating cordyceps mushrooms. And um, so, yeah, I did that probably back in like 2016. And then I, I did a talk with you guys on uh, where, where the farming has gone the last time I was there. And this is where I'm at now, um, which is something that I just started working on last winter um, and something I'm going to get into here probably tomorrow again um, and start learning some new things and working with this again. But um, breeding cordyceps militaris. Let's go. Um, so we'll go over a little bit of an overview and we're going to touch back on all of these things. Um, but the main key points in cordyceps breeding is number one, finding parent cultures. Um, what is going to be the parent of the um, offspring that you're going to be breeding out? Um, isolate spores from parent cultures. So as we all know, mushrooms produce spores. Um, cordyceps is an ascomycete like morel, so it produces ascospores. Um, but that technical term is not really necessary in understanding what we have going on here. Um, but for those of you that don't know, or I'm sure most of you guys know, because we're all mushroom nerds, it, takes, it usually takes two spores to come together for a fungus to um, have its genetic exchange. Um, or like the sex part for making a new, a, a new culture. Um, some, some mushrooms needs more than two spores or it has to have two compatible spores. Um, and cordyceps mushrooms have three different mating types. So it's like three different genders and two of them can only mate with the one other one. Um, the, uh, the two of them can't mate with each other. Um, so I have to figure out what their gender is basically before I start trying to breed them. So that's what it, that next part is determine mating type of isolated spores. Um, then I have to combine uh, the opposing mating types, the ones that will be able to work with each other. Um, I test new strains. So let's say you're trying to breed um, a new variety of pepper or something, and you were looking for a specific trait. Every time you bred two peppers together, you would test out the seeds uh, um, and see if it has the traits that you want. So no notice the traits of the offspring. And then I go back and combine isolated spores with desirable traits. So after I know which traits each of the individual parent spores um, are, are, ex are expressing, then I can breed together the ones that have, has the traits that I like the most. Um, so we'll just give you guys some pictures and, and talk about this a little bit more. Um, so yeah, finding parent strains, um, we typically do this in the wild. And um, this is different for individuals that don't have uh, cordyceps militaris growing in the wild. So let's say you live up in the Pacific Northwest where cordyceps are very rare. Um, finding a parent strain for you might just be buying a culture from somebody else, um, which is completely valid. Um, but here in Pennsylvania, we do have an abundance of cordyceps mushrooms in the summer. Um, so I typically get out into the forest, um, generally like an oak hemlock mixed forest. And I go looking in the big forest for little orange things, um, which takes a little bit of, t uh, a little while to key in on them. Um, but once you key in on them, they're a little bit easier to find. Um, and only the top orange stroma um, or the fruiting body of the cordyceps mushroom is the only part that's visible. Um, and then we dig up the uh, insect host, which is typically buried um, underground. And it's generally going to be um, a Lepidiopterian pupa, um, maybe Anisota senatoria, uh, which is the oak worm, uh, orange tipped oak worm moth, um, or something along the, that line. I can't remember what the common name is, but it's pretty long. Um, and then we also find them on sphinx moth pupa, which I don't know the Latin name for it. Um, and we probably find them on three different pupil hosts. Um, and every now and then we'll find them on larval hosts. Um, but as far as my area goes, it's mostly the Lepidiopterian pupa. Um, so, and the cordyceps will generally grow around where there's running water. 
there's moving water. I think it might be to help them move their spores. I don't necessarily know what the association is, um, but we generally find them more when there's moving water in the, in the area. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's in the ground. Um, it's pretty fun uh, to, tr to try and find something so small. Um, it's, it's just really exciting once you find them. So um, got a couple questions. Yep. Actually, how small are those? And like, how much do you have to get like down into the down on the floor to actually see them? Um, all right, I can't, they're about the size of like a house key, usually. Sometimes they're like the size of like your pinky finger if they're really tall. Um, but they're generally around the size of like a house key or like a, a, a key to your car. Um, and I don't have to, I just walk around. I can see them standing up, but um, my eyesight is pretty good. Um, my kid's closer to the ground. He sees them pretty easy. Um, but yeah, I can see them while I'm just walking. I just noticed like a, like a slight orange and, uh, against like the greens and the browns. And then I just squat down and check it out. Every, like every now and then it's like a stick or something or like a little something from a tree. Um, but uh, usually it's the cordyceps. And then just for people that haven't dug these up before, how far down below the fruiting body do you go? Um, I usually just stick my finger in there up to my knuckle and uh, feel around in there. Sometimes I like go around it with a knife, but usually I can just stick my finger in there and um, I'll feel around it. Um, first, I'll kind of like, I'll kind of like move the soil around it a little bit so I can kind of see which direction the stroma is going, which will kind of point towards where the bug is. And then I stick my finger down and like gently pop the bug up so I don't break it. Um, and the only reason I pulled a bug out is because um, it's easy to clone from the bug. And if I'm going to actually like consume them, um, the bug has a lot of valuable compounds in the mycelium. So I just like break the shell off and then I make a tea with the whole thing. Um, and then I eat the whole thing. Right. Um, that's the way they do it in China. They make it with the, with the, the insect attached. Um, yeah. The one, the only thing, with the ones in Pennsylvania, like the, the Anisota sedatoria, the oakworm moth one, um, it has like a, um, I forget what's the technical term for the thing on the back on, on their butt, but it has like a spiky, like horns on the butt end of it. And, and, the, and around the, the like thorax part of it is all spiky. So if you don't peel off the, the like shell or the exoskeleton, it'll like hurt your throat. Your throat. Yeah. So, so you got, it's all soft in the inside. It's just like a, a mummified insect in there, but the outside is pretty sharp. So like sometimes asking about um, whether this is year round for you or. No, no. Um, cordyceps usually start popping up in like um, June and then they stop at like the end of August. Okay. Um, sometimes they go into September. Like I actually found one like a couple weeks ago, but, um, or like a week or so ago, but that's like probably the latest I'll see them. <laughs> but I have had friends find them when it starts to snow. So who wow. knows? There, there's still a lot of mystery. Yeah. Okay. All right. So back to, back to the steps. Um, so yeah, I kind of like peel back the soil um, I try and expose the bug if I can. If it's in moss, it's a little bit easier because the, the, you don't have to dig around because the bug will just be right in the moss. Um, then I dig under there, pull the bug out, and I keep them all separate. Um, I don't want them because they're going to start shooting spores out uh, almost instantly. Like sometimes you can even see it. You like touch them and they start shooting spores out because they feel like they're disturbed. Um, I don't want their spores getting on to other specimens. So I keep them in these like little fish tackle boxes or like bead boxes you can get from like, like a craft store um, just to keep them separate. Um, and I try and clean them off pretty good before I put them in there because there's a lot of dirt on the bug. So I'll usually I have like the open L knife um, and I'll like brush, I'll brush off the dirt. Um, sometimes I have a little like squeeze thing that shoots air I, it's for cam for cleaning camera lenses yeah and i can shoot air on them to clean them off so because if you put them in there and they're all dirty it's going to get dirt all over the top of the mushroom and i want to get the spores out of it so i don't want the mushroom to be all dirty 
Right. Um, if you're going to be just collecting them to eat them, you can rinse them off and rinse the dirt off. Um, but I don't like to rinse them because I don't want to damage the parathesium, which is the spore bearing part. Like they don't have gills. They have these little, the little dimples on the top called parathesium where the spores come out. Um, and, and they fall off really easily. Like they, you can break them off of the mushroom really easily. Um, so I don't like to rinse them if I'm going to use them to get spores from it. But if you're going to just eat them or like make tea with it, you can rinse off the dirt but I just try and keep them as clean as I can. Um, so if you're going to buy a parent strain, if you're not in a place where you can find them in the wild, which if you're in Georgia, you can find them in the wild. Um, um, you can buy parent strains from terrestrial fungi or Appalachian gold. And I also sell cultures, um, but terrestrial fungi and Appalachian gold are two of my really good friends and they produce some of the best commercial genetics. And they're also breeding cordyceps. They're the only two other people that are selling cultures that actually breed cordyceps and that have been doing it long enough um, that they know what they're doing and they're putting out really good genetics. Um, so yeah, then uh, isolate spores from, from parent strains. So um, once the, both of these in these pictures are cultivated indoors. So these aren't wild ones, but I do the same thing with the wild ones. Um, I'll take the mushroom I'll, I'll usually break them or cut the mushroom off with a scalpel from the bug. Um, and then I'll take Vaseline and I'll put a dab of Vaseline with a Q-tip on the top of an agar dish. Um, and then I'll stick a, I'll stick the mushroom onto the Vaseline and I'll close the dish and I'll close the dish, but I won't put parafilm on it. So if anybody's familiar with lab work, we typically cover our dishes with this wax film so that um, contamination doesn't get in there but I don't put the wax film on it. And then I set it um, in front of a flow hood. So a little bit of air can actually get in there. Um, and this, and this stops humidity from building up in the Petri dish, which slows down the germination rate of the spores. Um, and also whenever I'm doing uh, spore drops, I make water agar instead of a nutrient agar um, because the nutrients makes the spores germinate and grow faster. Um, the mycelium will grow faster. I don't want them to grow fast. I want to be able to have as much time um, as I can to pick the spores out of there um, before they start growing. Because once they start growing, there's going to be hundreds of spores on this dish, thousands of spores on this dish. And when they start growing, as soon as it, the mycelium from one of them touches another one, they already exchange genetics. And that ruins it for me because they're already, they have already bred with each other and I need them to be single so I can see what what genetics they're the single spore is expressing um if that makes sense for anybody if not you can ask questions so people are asking and it sounds like you answered this but the kind of agar are you, so um are you buying it from a lab are you some people buy it from the asian grocery store right? which kind of agar are you using and then you're adding no nutrients is that what you're saying when you said water agar yeah, so I buy agar from the Asian market. Um, it's telephone brand. It comes in a 25 gram packet, which is great because I mix 25 grams of agar with a liter of liquid. Um, so when I do nutrient agar, I just mix it with a liter of coconut water. But when I do water agar, I just mix it with plain, like distilled, like no mineral, like nothing in it, just right. like filtered, super filtered, clean water. Um, and and that just slows things down a little bit. And, it, and, and water agar is also less likely to get contaminated. So when you're putting a dirty mushroom from outside in there, um, it helps. You could also add antibiotic, but I, I never have, I've never added antibiotic in my agar. Um, but if you're having issues, then you can add antibiotic in there. Like you can go get some like gentromycin or something from like a tractor supply for like chickens or like goats or something. Um, and, and it, and it comes in like a liquid that you inject. So you can just put the liquid in your agar mix after you sterilize it. Um, so I played around with, with cereal dilutions for cordyceps, um, spore isolation. So basically what you do is you get a bunch of spores on a dish and then you, um, pour, pour clean water on them, sterile water, and you use a micro pipette or a syringe to, take a little bit of that water and put it into more water and take a little bit of that water and put it into more water. And every time you do this, there's less and less spores in the next one. Um, but the one thing that I noticed about this is that you can get single spore isolates by doing cereal, cereal dilutions, but 
Um, the ASCO spores from the cordyceps are like straight shards of glass and they'll break in, in cereal dilutions. Wow. Um, and, and the way that ASCO spores are structured, I think I have a picture of it in here, but there's parts of the genetics in different parts of the spore. Like, so if it breaks, then you're not getting the entirety of that ge the gene expression from that parent strain. So um, instead of cereal dilution, what I started doing was um, using my microscope, I put my microscope in front of my flow hood. I open the Petri dish when it has a bunch of spores on it. And I'll use the weakest magnification to find where the spores are. And then I'll go to like most of the spores will drop in a print in a general area. But some of the spores, especially when I put it in front of the flow hood, the, the, wind, the air moving through it makes some of the spores fly to away from the rest of them. Um, so I'll try and find the edge of where the main spore print is. And then I'll look around the edge and I'll find spores that are by themselves. Um, so typically I'll let them drop spores. Depending on how vigorous they are, they'll drop spores within a couple hours. Um, if, they're, if they're slow, sometimes it'll take like a day or two. Um, but I'll leave them like maybe overnight. And then I'll wake up the next morning. I'll take the mushroom out so it stops dropping spores in there. I'll check on them. And then I'll give them one more day to germinate. Um, and when they germinate, you can see them better with your eyes. So like you have to have good eyes to do this or like um, maybe get a kid to do it or something. Um, <laughs> if, if they have a steady hand, I, I could get my kid to do this if he, if he could stay focused on something for long enough. But um, when you shine, when you, when you have the microscope on it and you find a single spore under the microscope, you can play with the light, how intense the light is under the microscope, and it'll make the spore kind of glow in the light. And then you can use a scalpel and pick it and, and pull it out. Um, so that's probably the hardest part of all of this is isolating spores. And uh, my friend Ryan does it a different way, and I don't know how he does it. Um, he's kind of keeping that proprietary. Hmm. But getting at the single spore is probably the hardest part of this whole process because you have to like have good eyesight and be able to like have a steady enough hand that you can pull a microscopic spore out of a Petri dish um, by itself. Um, and then how do you tell that it's by itself? How do you tell for certain that it's not already combined with something? Well, you can put it on a Petri dish, a nutritive Petri dish now, and let it sit in the light for a little bit, generally like a week. But I usually try and work faster than that. But because there's two ways to tell. If you set them in the light for like a week or two, um, they'll turn orange and that's okay. But if they turn orange and then mushroom starts growing on, on them, that means they've already combined with another spore and then you're, you need to go back to the drawing board. Um, but I don't know if you can see on the side here, it says test for mat. Um, and that's mating type. That mat is just what I use, was the, is the word I use for mating type. Um, so if I test it for mating type, um, these are, this is a collection of, of single iso single, single isolated ascospores that I had, um, that, um, I needed to test for a mating type. Um, and determining mating type requires me to do some DNA work. Um, so I have a PCR machine in my lab, a polymerase chain reaction machine, which allows me to um, amplify DNA. So I have to extract the DNA from the mycelium, um, which is fairly easy. And I have a YouTube video that I can drop the link in the chat if anybody wants to go in depth on this process, but I have a whole YouTube video on how I do this. Um, but I isolate or I extract DNA from the mycelium. Um, and then I add specific primers, which bind to different genes in the DNA. Um, and I have the primers that I use bind to the mating type locust. So genes are on a locust on a DNA, but that's a whole different class. Um, so I basically put in, I put in um, this solution that binds with the type of the part of the DNA that I need to understand whether it's a boy or a girl, just like humans. Like you can look at a human DNA and it'll tell you whether or not it's a boy or a girl. If that, if you can't tell from macroscopically, um, but so anyways, um, once I do that, I amplify the DNA until I have billions of copies of the DNA, which allows me to see it on a gel, on an agarose gel um, with utilize, I utilize electricity and a fluorescent dye in the gel um, to see the DNA bands. 
and um, in the in the agarose gel, I put usually like nine wells. Um, there's little holes where I can put the DNA solution at the end. And on the last one, I put what's called a ladder, um, which you can see there's a couple, there's a lot of lines on the one that's to the very right here. Each one of those lines represents the amount of base pairs. So the very bottom line is very faint, but that's 100 base pairs. The next one's 200 base pairs, 300, and it goes up to a thousand. Um, and I know that the mating type, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So mating type one for the cordyceps. So we have mating type one, mating type two, one, and mating type two, two. Mating type two, one, and two, two, um, can only, can only mate with mating type one, but mating type one can't mate with itself and mating type one or two, one, and two, two can't mate with each other. Um, so the mating type one locust has about 500 base pairs and the mating type two locust has like 430 or something. So it's closer to the 400 band. So if, if no, I didn't get any other results, then I could tell that's what it was. Um, but for each two wells, I, for each sample, I do two. I have to test for mating type one or mating type two. Um, so if I put... So the first two wells here has the first sample, the first culture, first spore. And you can see only one of the bands lit up. So that means for one, there's only one mating type there. So it is a single spore. And two, um, only the first one lit up. So it's a mating type one. So for the next two, I can tell it's a single spore and only the first one lit up. So that's mating type one. The next one, there's no results. So that means I messed something up when I did that. And then the last one, the first well lit up. So that's another mating type one. So all of them in that round were mating type one. Um, and uh, yeah, that's basically how I tell what the gender is. And then once I figure out what the gender is, I can combine the opposing mating types by taking a piece of the mycelium from one, putting it on a Petri dish next to a piece of mycelium from the other one. And then they'll combine and that'll be the part where the spores connect um, and they exchange their genetics. So once I do that, I let that culture grow out. Um, and then I put it on a liquid culture and then I, Put it, I grow it out on a rice substrate because that's what cordyceps likes to fruit on is rice substrate. Um, and then I note the traits of the offspring. So each different combination produces radically different offspring. But after, you, after you've used a single parent so many times for breeding, you'll, you'll notice certain traits that only comes from that parent culture. Um, like this one's cool. This one has long... Um, long stroma but it, it doesn't fill out the the cake that well like this one fills out the cake really well that means you're getting a better yield um this one looks has a really nice color and i like the bulbous tops on it but it also doesn't fill out the cake as much as i'd want it to this one has really nice long stroma um so one of those parents it's probably the same similar parent as this one um is is producing long stroma so if i can combine whichever parent is making them long with a parent that is making them densely clustered like this first one, then I'll get a strain that I really like. Um, this picture is interesting because um, these specimens look very different, but they share one of the same parents. Um, and that parent trait is really hard to notice. Um, but after so many trials with these parents, is it's the height. Um, there, this one on the right is a little bit taller due to its other parent. Um, but the, the one parent that they share um, makes them not grow so tall. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different variations that you'll notice when you're working with things like this. Um, and then eventually when I'm testing so many strains, I always end up with lots of cordyceps, um, which is cool because then I can eat them or like sell them to, to fund more research. Um, and then I go back and I combine uh, isolated spores with desirable traits. So this one was really cool because it had like a really dark pigmentation. It was almost red. Um, so I went back and I took spores from that one and I was like, all right, I'm going to play around with this and see if I can't like get that red to come out. So at that point you can back cross them. So I'm like, this one has this red trait. I can back cross it with its parents or I can back cross it to itself, um, to try and like amplify that red genetic. Are and, you explaining back cross to people? Um, back crossing is, is, is a term that was developed around plant breeding um, where you take an offspring of a plant and you breed it back to its parents to solidify like a specific gene type or a specific expression. 
it sounds kind of weird, but it's not as weird for like plants and like mushrooms and stuff. As incestual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 okay. It um when you do it with plants or with mushrooms, it solidifies specific uh, gene expression. So like like this red this red color, I can breed it back to whatever one of its parents that gave it that red color, and that red color will come out more so like solidified. Um. So yeah, that's what I spend my time doing. I'm in the lab, nerding out, playing with weird mushrooms. Um, I need to update this picture, but I just released a new book, A Cordyceps Cultivation Handbook, Volume 2. Um, it's available at microshop.net. It's currently backordered. Um, every time I get new copies, they sell out like immediately. So I need to get more printed right now. Um, but yeah, um, I'm also doing field genomics work. And I also need to update this because I'm not doing <laughs> A mating type ID class this Thursday. But um, if anybody wants to support the work, you can uh, send me a donation at this PayPal link up here, just paypal.me backslash mycosymbiotics, and it'll help with more field genomic work next year um, for a lot of different types of mushrooms, not just cordyceps, but it also helped me um, to get a fluorometer, which I really need so I can do DNA sequencing. Um, I have this little tool in my lab that I can do DNA sequencing. Um, but it's really expensive to run it. So I need to have a fluorometer to, um, quantify my DNA and tell me that I have enough DNA before I run it through a $600 reuse this disposable reusable thing, um, that, that might, that I might, um, devalue by running it. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, that's the information for that.